When it comes to MMA, the stories told are full of hope, triumph and victory. The tales included in this video feature no such themes. There is only hopelessness, death and heartbreak. Today I'm sharing with you the most disturbing UFC stories I have found. Tragedy only known on the fringes of this sport. As we go down the list, they will only get more disturbing and more obscure. The final tale, truly tough to put together. So sit back. I'm out of water. It's pretty hot out here. I think, I think if I wait the sun down, I can make it back to camp. If you don't hear from me by morning, call for help. It is September 3rd. A lone motorcyclist is carving a route into the remote regions of the Californian desert, a furnace that is spelled doom for many inexperienced wanderers. The motorcyclist has been called to the desert by an unknown force, there to experience the untouched, ancient lands unmolested by modern man. The drifter was a former champion, and this expedition into the harsh, arid sands of a place known as Death Valley would be his first and last. This is the last pilgrimage of Evan Tanner. It was April 12th, 1997, in the sweltering and dusty heat of Amarillo, Texas, and Evan Tanner was beginning his long and illustrious MMA career. Tanner was a pioneer of the sport, and shortly after UFC 1 had gripped the masses in a no-hold-barred bloodbath spectacle, Tanner would find himself in the ring of USWF 4, a one-night tournament where competitors were expected to battle it out over the course of three fights to win a savage heavyweight affair. That night he would defeat all of his opponents by way of stoppage, utilising his extensive talent as a former state champion wrestler. It was just the beginning of a long and active MMA legacy. His career would take him to the other side of the globe, challenging the men of Japan in the vintage and classic tournaments of Pan Greece, becoming the first ever American to win a Neoblood one night bracket. This drifting across the globe was something that suited Evan. He had always been on his own since childhood, he rarely socialised, had strayed from his family in his teenage years and would often move around the country looking to connect with the natural world around him. This meant that he trained martial arts completely on his own and with no help from outside forces. Despite this unconventional and strange approach to life and his MMA career, he would still continue to develop a spectacular resume in the sport. And after 17 fights, of which he lost only one, he would be welcomed into the UFC, making his debut in 1999 at UFC 18, a fight where he went on to defeat Daryl Gola in a heavyweight bout. After competing in 25 bouts in just three years, the UFC offered him his first shot at UFC Gold to take place at UFC 30. He would be taking on everyone's favourite tongue-tied meathead, Tito Ortiz the current reigning light heavyweight champion of the world. For the first 10 seconds of the title fight, the two men would circle each other, gauging the distance. Then they threw a handful of strikes which led to them being tied up against the cage. Tito would grab a hold of Tanner in a dominant body lock. He utilised this to viciously slam Tanner on his head, smashing him full force into the canvas, knocking him unconscious. Tanner had just lost his first chance at UFC Gold. After the title fight lost to Tito, Tanner knew that things needed to change in his training. Up until that point, he had always been alone, learning jiu-jitsu from VHS tapes and finishing holds from instructional booklets. His less than conventional lonerism in regards to training was something to be admired considering how far it had gotten him, a world title shot and a 23-3 record. But if he truly wanted to become world champion, then he would have to find a gym, 
a big ask for an extremely introverted individual who didn't have friends and had abandoned his family in pursuit of a lone voyage through life's mysteries. Resisting his innate problematic societal tendencies, he packed his van, got on the road and went all the way from Texas to Oregon, there to join Team Quest with the likes of Randy Couture and Chael Sonnen. With some proper teammates behind him and a coach, Evan would carve out an incredible series of wins, ultimately going 8-1, a loss only to future legend of the UFC Rich Franklin. It was clear that this Tanner was rejuvenated and a force to be reckoned with inside of the cage. He was an intimidating looking man inside of the octagon for sure, but there was a side to him that those who knew him well were aware of, and as previously stated, there was only a handful of people who he'd let into his life. Tanner, unfortunately, was battling more than just opponents in the cage during his MMA career. He had lost himself to the bottle, regularly disappearing for days and nights binge drinking, choking under the suffocating hold that spirits and beer do men and women alike to. Even with his most recent spectacular run that he had pulled off in his division, the siren's song was always playing, a melody to lure him into drunkenness, even as an athlete on top of the world. Evans' performances during this time meant that he was called upon to face David Terrell for the vacant UFC middleweight title. At this point, he was still lost in an intoxicated haze. The matchmakers had to contact him through his blog, as he either didn't have a phone or had misplaced it. When it came time to start a fight camp, he was not even close to being a middleweight, but not in the way that you'd normally expect. He had lost so much weight and muscle in his battle with alcohol that he had become weak and wasted. This was nothing new though. This was a vicious cycle that had haunted Tanner his entire fighting career. A bad drinking habit that he had formed in his lone years as a drifter. He would cyclically destroy his body, drown his demons in alcohol, and then return for a fight camp, step in the ring looking like a monstrous force, and then sadly, return to the bottle. Again and again. Victory followed by suffering. Victory followed by pain. At UFC 51, Tanner was back. He would step into the octagon with his body rejuvenated after the cessation of alcohol. And just over a decade into the sport's inception, Tanner would become the third ever UFC middleweight champion, knocking out his undefeated opponent in the first round. Bearing in mind, this was a fight in which he was a sizable underdog. He had been written off against his much hyped up foe. It was a wondrous story in which a pioneer of the sport, who had battled it out on all frontiers across the globe, had wrapped the most prestigious belt of them all around his waist, persevering in a ruthless sport even after it eluded him the first time. Tanner never gave up, whether it was inside of the cage or his even tougher battles outside of it. But just because he never gave up doesn't mean that staying in the fight wasn't a daily self-destructive battle for Tanner. I accepted the fight at UFC 59. They gave me focus for a time, but afterwards there was nothing. I fell into a deep depression and I traveled all over the country trying to run from it. Even with the belt, Tanner could not be lifted to a higher place. He would continue to step into the cage, but it was really just hit or miss. His next fight, the belt would be snapped away from him, courtesy of Rich Franklin. But I doubt he cared very much. Whilst getting the belt was something that he had dreamed of, it was merely a means to an end. Becoming champion meant exposure. Tanner wanted to change the world with his words. He had always been more concerned with becoming a philosopher. He felt that his words could have a very real impact on people. He was never far away from a book. In fact, most people knew that if he wasn't training, he was either drinking or reading, probably both. Unsurprisingly, Tanner lived in an empty flat, no furnishings. He ate off of plastic cups and plastic plates. There was nothing but books and a bed. Fighting really was just a means to an end. The only way he knew how to make an honest, decent amount of cash, which would enable him to travel the country, or as he put it, to run away from his very real problems. But he did a lot of good on his travels, building playgrounds, giving to charity, and helping to develop young athletes, trying to pass his wisdom onto those he thought he could help. The drinking didn't get any better though. A drifter trying to change the world, but with a haunting shadow following his every step. Tanner's passion of spreading his writings to the masses would eventually find a platform, one where he could share his thoughts to an eager to listen audience. In the early 2000s, an MMA forum known as Spike.com would become his way of maintaining a blog, the first real glimpses of the social media pandemic to come. His journaling on the platform gained a lot of attraction amongst fight fans. It was surprising to them perhaps that a man so brutal inside of the cage was so gentle and thoughtful outside of it. Compliments on his writing would be thrown his way at every opportunity. People were impressed, and as a self-confessed narcissist, these compliments fueled a desire within Tanner to write more, dream of becoming an author, and to perhaps go mainstream as a contemporary thinker. But the problem was, his writings, to those who knew him well, were more of a ramble. Words constructed during an intoxicated haze at the end of three days of staying awake. 
His words were written from the perspective of a man whose view on the world wasn't entirely hopeful. Tanner was staring deep into society through a distorted nihilistic lens. It goes without saying that he was a broken warrior trapped in an inescapable alcoholic noose. The problem with people who tell this story is that they miss this part. They avoid a harsher reality that many of his close friends understood. People want to glorify this part of Tanner because it's nice, but people like Chael knew the ugly truth behind it all. I'm only trying to paint this picture as it becomes far more relevant as we go deeper into this story. Just because Evan wanted to be perceived as a philosopher and he had found a group of fans who had convinced him he was, doesn't actually mean it was the case. The next two years of Evan's life was documented at every step on Spike.com. His writings were loved by those in the MMA world, but all these compliments from strangers on the internet were about to fuel a tragic set of events. After losing to Rich Franklin, he would go on to win one out of his next four fights. It was after his last loss at the start of 2008 that he decided to take a step away from the fight game. The society that he lived in had started to erode his connection with nature, and on August 16th, 2008, he let as much be known on his blog. It's Saturday night. I'm sitting on my couch beside a stack of books, reading about the Southern California desert. I'm hoping that very soon I'll be sitting out in the quiet of the desert beneath the deep blue midnight sky, listening to the calm desert breeze. Tonight, I ran to the store to pick up a few things, and with the lonesome, quiet desert thoughts in my mind, I couldn't help but be struck with their brutally stark contrast to my current surroundings, the amazing congestion in which we exist day to day. The landscape, as far as I could see, crowded, choked with me and the rest of the species, an almost writhing mass of organisms fighting over space and resources, on the highways, in the parking lots, on the sidewalks, and in the aisles of the stores. And to think, there are still places in the world where man has not been, where he has left no footprints, where the mysteries stand secure untouched by human eyes. I want to go to these places, the quiet, timeless, ageless places, and sit, letting silence and solitude be my teachers. I've been gathering my gear for this adventure for over a month, not a long time by most standards, but far too long for my impatient nature. I plan on going so deep into the desert that any failure of my equipment could cost me my life. One more week. I think one more week, and I'll be ready to go. Tanner was planning a solo adventure out into the desert of South California, a place where he could go to discover the untouched plains where no human eye had glanced at the lands. And whilst his reasoning was certainly poetic and somewhat grounded, it eluded the reality, which was, the reason no man had been or seen this land before is because that region is desolate arid and deadly. It is beyond dangerous for most species on this planet. Tanner voiced displeasure with the route society had stumbled down, but his escape from that suffocating urban expanse was somewhat misplaced. The desert is not to be trifled with. Just over 10 days later, he would update his followers, who had all voiced concerns over Tanner's idea to go into the desert. It seems some MMA websites have reported on the story, posting that I might die out in the desert or that it might be my greatest opponent yet, etc. Come on, guys. It's really common down in Southern California to go to the off-road recreation areas in the desert about an hour away from LA and San Diego. So my plan is to go out to the desert, do some camping, ride the motorcycle, and shoot some guns. This isn't a version of Into the Wild. I'm going out into the desert with a pair of shorts and a bowie knife to try to live off the land. I'm going fully geared up and I'm planning to have some fun. The concerns were certainly valid, but there is no convincing a man who has done everything himself his whole life. That single-minded stubbornness is what makes a champion, and unfortunately, it was the same one forcing him to make this less than sensible decision. It's Tuesday night. Tomorrow I will go out into the desert. It has taken over a month to get all the gear together. The preparation for this adventure took far longer than I'd expected. I've never done this before, so I took my time reading books, studying the land, 
and researching gear. A few weeks of solitude in the desert, and then back to civilization, and back to training. I'm out of water. It's pretty hot out here. I think, I think if I wait to sundown, I can make it back to camp. If you don't hear from me by morning, call for help. The first rays of sunshine broke along the cracked and dry desert a beautiful view that would have been an important moment for Tanner to experience, a part of his healing amidst his self-imposed exile. But this sunrise was one in which Tanner would never behold. Police say after days of searching for Tanner, his body was found Monday about two miles from his campsite near the Palo Verdes Mountains where temperatures have reached 110 degrees. Investigators think the middleweight class fighter may have died of heat exposure. Tanner left for the desert last week to go camping and motorcycle riding. In a Spike.com blog entry on August 16th, Tanner wrote that he had an insatiable appetite for adventure and exploration, and that the idea to journey into the desert came from a conversation with a friend. The celeb fighter called a friend last week to say that his dirt bike had run out of gas. The confusing thing regarding Tanner's death was that he had abandoned his motorcycle and camp in order to find water, but the police would find more than enough water back at his camp to carry him through the next day or so. Most have put this up to the confusion that dehydration can cause. Tanner's death serves as a bitter reminder that despite our best laid plans, Mother Nature is the great equaliser and is never to be taken lightly. We are at her mercy, and maybe Tanner was right that we simply have strayed too far into comfortability and forgotten this. His death was a shock to the MMA community. They had lost a great, honest champion under such grim circumstances, but for Evan, this was the life he had always lived, teetering on the edge whether that was mentally with his struggles of introversion and alcoholism, physically pushing his body to the extreme as a world caliber athlete, or exploring the vastness of nature, a dangerous place that fascinated him so much. Tanner's life wasn't easy, but he lived it the only way he knew how. Everything's been about the journey. I never really set out with goals for fighting. It's been about the adventure along the way. When you're on your deathbed, it's those stories, those little adventures, that are going to be the things that you remember. It's not so much getting there, but how you got there. For people who knew him well, the writings were more of a ramble. Evan, over the course of a couple years, had been somewhat socially engineered to grow deeper and more philosophical courtesy of parasocial relationships on a blog. Mix that with alcohol abuse, and it's no wonder it went south so quickly. Tanner had probably convinced himself that a pilgrimage into the harsh desert was not only something that he could handle, but probably felt it was his responsibility as a modern day philosophical writer. His blog demanded an odyssey, a venture into the unknown, all to fulfill a role that he had been coerced into. The fact is, probably out of respect, Evan's story became sensationalized and glorified, but all those YouTube videos and articles did was distort the ugly truth. The real story is alcohol is a demon latched onto the soul, and no amount of glory inside of the cage should ever cover that up. Sleepless days infused with binge drinking killed Evan Tanner, not the desert, and all the while an anonymous crowd of MySpace onlookers cheered him into the grave. It's a sentiment shared by his close friend Chael Sonnen, the video of which is in the description for you to watch after this one, as it gives you a bit of context as to what was going on during that period of Evan's life. His friends would want Evan to be remembered, not for his strange writings, but rather the fact that he was a hardworking, quiet drifter, a champion, and a man who would give you the shirt off his back. That is the real Evan Tanner. I just want to say that if you're enjoying this video, then please consider signing up to my Patreon in the link below. You'll get access to these videos days, sometimes weeks in advance exclusive podcasts, director's commentary, and your name in the credits. I'm extremely grateful for any and all support, even just watching the video itself, so thank you. Whilst I wish I could say the next story in this video would offer us some respite from this rather grim subject matter, 
I must instead warn you that things only get worse from here. This next one is very dear to my heart and it was extremely hard to put together. The story just goes from heartbreak to more tragedy and more tragedy until it's all over. The Ultimate Fighter is the toughest tournament in sports. This is the toughest tournament this sport uh, has ever seen. Fighting four times in five weeks, um, you know, it's gonna be hell for these guys, for sure. This is the, the moment for exposure and opportunity that I've been waiting for. Hopefully when I look back on this experience, I'll be able to say that I did all I can to win. All right, gentlemen, here we go, all right? Now bring it on. Are you guys ready? Is that what he yelled? Are you guys ready? Is that what he said? Yeah. Moving in the house, Josh the man. Josh Saman made his way onto the Ultimate Fighter reality TV show with a 9-2 record, eight of those wins coming by way of stoppage. He would be picked up by Coach Jones and was off to a fantastic start, getting three finishes, all within the first round to advance to the semi-finals. The finals, just one more fight away, but a fighter stood in his way, Kelvin Gastelum. He would, unfortunately, come up short against Gastelum, the man who would eventually go on to win the season final. But as with a lot of fighters who filter through the show, he would have a chance of redemption by competing in the live finals, where he would take on Kevin Casey, knocking him out in the second round and getting himself a dream contract with the UFC. Perhaps not in the way that he had intended by lifting the Ultimate Fighter trophy, but it was still a crowning moment of his life, one that he would share with his girlfriend, Hayley Bevis. Hayley was a woman who had fluttered in and out of Josh's life since childhood, both of whom had battled substance misuse, but had pulled through it together, creating an inseparable bond. Josh, now with his dream of joining the UFC, realized would move to Miami, there to buy a house and to join a top gym in the area, MMA Masters. Josh wanted his UFC career to be dominant, and he was doing everything in his power to make it come true. Unfortunately, around this time, Haley had been diagnosed with hepatitis C, a destructive blood disease that she had contracted from substance misuse all those years ago. The treatment for this illness is brutal, but together Josh and Haley would face it head on. It was an illness that could be easily passed on between intimate couples, and risked Josh losing his place in the UFC, as blood diseases are career enders in MMA. In Josh's mind, despite the UFC being everything that he had ever wanted, Haley came first. The symptoms of the treatment began to set in, and it wasn't pretty. Lethargy, mood swings, nausea, and hair loss. It took a toll on both of their lives emotionally, but finishing the treatment meant a life together without fear of this illness. About halfway through the treatment, Josh was required to spend over a week away from Haley in August of 2016, as he was helping some of his teammates try out for the new season of The Ultimate Fighter. Before leaving, they would go to their favorite spot, a long, beautiful beach near their home. There, they would talk of their future together, but little did they know how haunting this conversation would become. What else do you want to do in life? She asked. I guess I did have a list of things I'd thought about before. I want to learn a new language, and then I also want to make combat night bigger. We will. I liked her saying, we. And I want to headline a UFC event one day. You will. She said confidently. And I want to get married and have a family, I told her. We will, she said, turning to me. Won't we? Something about the way she worded it gave me chills. This life of mine was quickly becoming ours. I'd thought about how I would ask her when the day would come. And last, I'd like to write a book before I die. Well, do you think I'll be in your book? Darling, if I had to guess, I'd say you'll be the whole damn thing. On August 26th, Josh Saman was making his way back to Miami after failing to get both of his teammates onto the Ultimate Fighter. Haley was on the road, driving back to meet Josh. Both were excited to reunite after a while of being away from each other. They began to text. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
At 8.41, just five minutes after Haley's last text, a highway patrol officer would stumble across Haley's wrecked car that had veered off the road into a tree. Haley passed away on impact. Josh would say that the texting was a bad habit, something that they had always done. When the police informed him of the time of the crash, he ran to his phone, checked the time of the last text message. Josh's world closed in even more. As far as he was concerned, he was responsible for the accident. He had killed her. The, the time between the first responder on the accident and the last text that she sent me was remarkably close. Um, so I, I don't know that I'm not sure that it could lead to any other conclusion than that. Months after that was just the worst time of my life. I was in such a deep, dark hole that, that I wasn't sure I would ever make it out. Said I'm trying to remember just where it all began Just when I let you into my path again People say you don't know what you have until it's gone. I knew what I had when I had it. I had never been happier in my whole life. You write, I killed the thing I love the most. You blamed yourself. Yeah, I had a lot of guilt. I blamed myself for a lot of it. And You uh, bought a I, I found a somewhere. How close did you come to uh, It's hard to say sometimes. Those were always very inebriated nights. The whole thing kind of felt like a, a, a night where I just wanted to just go to sleep and, and just have it be over. Josh would ultimately battle a crippling depression that made him lose sight of his goals in life, falling out of love with fighting and wanting to end it all. He was broke without the woman that he loved. He fell back into substance misuse. The days, weeks and months blurred into one. Countless nights waking up with the people beside him. The incoherent haze that his life had turned into was Russian roulette. Life does not serve us and Josh would be reminded in the most horrific of ways. First Haley, then just a month later, Sue, Haley's mother would pass, a mother figure who Josh had shared the burden of suffering with. Then Juice, Haley and Josh's dog, a man's best friend, was taken too. The sequence of events cannot be understated in how vicious and cruel it was. The became even more tempting. I don't remember where I got the Most mornings, I woke up next to it. I couldn't remember how close I'd gotten the night before. Some nights I did remember. I remember pressing cold steel against my forehead trying to conceptualize my pain being gone. I was comforted by the availability of it. Just do it, bitch. After months of being broken, consumed with guilt and loss, Tanner's coaches finally managed to split the darkness. They had slowly convinced him that a return fight in the name of Haley, who had always wanted nothing more than for him to succeed as a fighter, was the perfect way to honor her. Josh came around to the idea and began training, finding purpose amidst the chaos. And in the first quarter of the next year, he had found an opponent, taking on Kiao Magalhaes in late April 2014. Training camp was going well, and Josh felt confident that his preparation meant that he could walk away with a win. But when it rains, it pours. Stephanie Haynes would report for Bloody Elbow that two weeks before his fight, Josh had torn his hamstring completely off the bone. He would be out for months, unable to train, stuck once again alone. Just three months later, the UFC announced a pay-per-view to take place on December 6th, 2014. Headlined by Chris Weidman and Vitor Belfort, the date of this pay-per-view, seemingly meaningless to most, was anything but for one person. December 6th was Haley Bevis's birthday. Josh, halfway through his recovery of his hamstring injury, called his manager. Josh was going to fight on this card, no matter what. 
This was destiny. It was the world calling forth a miracle, and Josh was going to make sure it happened. Two months later, and the fight was announced. Josh would be taking on Eddie Gordon, a man fresh off of winning the Ultimate Fighter Series 19, a dominant and strong fighter with a point to prove in the UFC. Saman didn't really care though. This was going to be his and his loved one's moment. This was Haley's birthday, and the fight to honour her. He set about his training as much as his injury could handle, focused and driven. A long, gruelling and painful training camp, not only rehabbing an injury, but knowing that at the very end of it, he would have to take on a surging contender is a heavy burden to bear. He would say that the outcome cannot be guaranteed, but the dedication of the fight and the process can. All that energy directed at carrying his girlfriend's name into the cage. With an event so perfectly coinciding with Haley's birthday, it was almost as if the universe itself had a design to see Josh ascend. It is in rare circumstances this sport provides moments of obscene beauty and mystery, glimpses into a veil that we understand so little of. Josh had been the victim of more tragedy and heartbreak than can ever be imagined by most. And here he was, provided with an opportunity, in perfect coincidence, to scream back into the void with triumph. A trial of blood and sweat lay out before Josh, and on the other side of it was resolution and hope. I think Eddie will know when he gets in the cage and sees me. He'll understand that the night is mine and not his. Swing in at 185 and one half pounds. Fighting at a Tallahassee, Florida, Josh Augusta! Here we go! Josh Salmon in the red trunks. Eddie Gordon in the black trunks. Oh! That kick out! It is all over! Oh Just my like goodness! That. Oh Whoa. my goodness! Out of emotional Josh Salmon! And tonight was easy compared to what my family and I and my loved ones in Tallahassee have been through. This is for Haley and Sue and Jeff and my mom and everybody in Tallahassee, A5O, I love you guys, you're my heart, thank you for so much. His girlfriend Haley Bevis, his birthday, he lost her over a year ago. This fight was absolutely a vehicle for closure for me. And, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to feel on December 7th, on tomorrow when I wake up in the morning. But, um, you know, it, it, it's really difficult for me to say that one chapter of my life is done because this is a part of my life. You know, Haley will always be a part of my life, and the other special people that I've lost will always be a big part of me. Um, but, you know, this is, abs you know, at, at least a step forward in the right direction that I can. Um, you know, that I, that, I, that, I, that I can still do things and I don't feel so crippled anymore. I wash off my sweat and the sweat of my opponent. Down the drain it goes with the pain and regrets amassed over a tumultuous 612 days. I wasn't rid of it all yet, but it was a start. I cry more, realizing that it is all over. Until next time. Josh was hopeful of some closure on this chapter of his life. He spoke of moving forward, a bird signalling rebirth tattooed onto his ribs weeks before the fight, and a ring infused with Haley's hair dangling from his neck. It was done. Josh told the media that it was time for him to pick the pieces of his life up and attempt to move forward. Just six months later, Josh would get a chance to face his original opponent after Haley's passing, Kial Magalhaes, at the Ultimate Fighter Final in July. The bout would headline the prelims, and Josh was looking to snap the four-fight winning streak of the surging Brazilian. In a bloody performance of the night, Josh would execute a near-flawless bout, bludgeoning Magalhaes before submitting him via rear naked choke in the first round. Unfortunately, in Salmon's next outing, he would be submitted by returning UFC vet Tamden McCory in a back and forth fight. In the background of his fighting career, Josh would continue to work as the highly successful promoter of Combat Night, but more importantly, he had been meticulously constructing a memoir, detailing his life from substance abuse, his fighting career, and ultimately, his star-crossed romance with Haley and her tragic passing. In April 2016, he would release the book, a final love note to the woman that he loved. The memoir is called The Housekeeper, Love, Death, and Prize Fighting. It came out Wednesday, and it can be found on Amazon.com. Uh, you know, this is a very personal look into your life. Was it 
therapeutic for you, Josh? Yeah, that was one aspect of it, and there was a lot of catharsis to be gained from uh, from writing everything down and just trying to make sense of the whole thing. But <clears throat> the functions of uh, of this book were just plentiful, you know. I mean, it was to connect with people that may be going through similar situations. Um, you know, it was to... Uh, you know, to, to immortalize her and just and keep the memories alive. And, and I mean, a big part of it was to, uh, you know, to open up discussion um, about things um, that I struggled with that a lot of people struggle with, you know. The book tackles a lot of dark subjects and Josh is truly a fantastic author. His level of detail and analysis are unparalleled when it comes to fighters who have taken to writing, not letting ghostwriters spoil the story. The book is in the description and I highly encourage people to purchase it and give it a read. The book was written, but this story was far from over. And unfortunately, things, if you didn't think possible, were about to get even worse. Well, you're 12 and three, three and one in the UFC, and congratulations, a big news that you're now facing veteran of 28 fights, Tim Boach. Josh would step into the octagon against Tim Boach at UFC Sioux Falls in July of that year. It was Josh's moment to not only avenge his first loss in the UFC, but to promote the book that honored the woman he loved. Tim Boach was a veteran of the UFC, crafty and extremely strong for the division, but had somewhat failed to gather momentum, losing six of his last eight performances, albeit against top caliber competition. It felt that Josh was being pushed by the UFC, and Tim was a great, respected opponent to get him back on track. Unfortunately, Josh would be knocked out in the second round after a close first. In between rounds, the corners had two very different stories. Tim would grow in confidence as his corner would hype him up, telling him that he had won the first, and that Josh was panicking. In Josh's corner, they were trying to calm him down, to make him concentrate and to stay at range. But Josh seemed distracted, exhausted, and almost as if he was ignoring his corner. Who knows what was going through his mind, but Josh seemed to abandon whatever game plan they had, ultimately dooming him to his second loss in a row. He was still very young in the game, however, only 28, and clearly a very talented athlete. Surely he would bounce back. After the loss, Josh would drift away from his coaches and friends. He seemed lost. He had unfortunately returned to drug use, despite attempts from multiple people to get him to abandon this path. It seemed as though writing that book was the conclusion of it all. The return fight against Eddie Gordon, in Haley's name, those two years ago, was always a final chapter of sorts for Josh. And whilst he assumed it would be the beginning of a new story for his life, it never quite happened. And so, it was no wonder he slipped back into old habits, returned to the chasm, return to depression, and return to drug use. Admits the wild nights and battling his demons, Josh would actually accept a return fight in December, but Josh's coaches noticed that he was distant, distracted, and acting strange during half-effort training sessions. And then, the twilight of hope sank beyond the horizon. Josh had tried so hard to carry on, laden with guilt, ravaged by loss, and now he was aimless beyond the release of his writings. And so naturally, all journeys have an end. If you have not heard, I am sorry to inform you that UFC uh, middleweight and veteran for the Ultimate Fighter 17, Josh Saman, has passed away. On September 29th, 2016, Josh was found unresponsive in a hotel room after a deadly concoction of drugs was taken. On October 5th, after almost a week of being in a coma, Josh was pronounced dead. No one knows for sure if it was intentional or not, but it goes without saying that night Haley died, so did Josh. Saman's mother would tie a bow on Josh's life in the most bittersweet yet poignant way, stating a few weeks later, In my heart, I just said, you know, he just wants to go home with Haley. That's all he wants to do. And now he is. Josh leaves us all behind his legacy in the form of the book that he wrote, and its closing paragraph, written six months before his passing, is a truly haunting yet powerful thing to behold. I still don't fear dying nowadays. Everyone has a birthday and a death day, and it's the singularity of life that makes it so special. We're marching toward the end from day one. As we march, ask yourself, if your end were to come today, what seeds did you plant? What will you be a vessel for? What will your verse be? are brown, yeah, and the sky is gray. I went for a walk on a winter's day. I've been
me safe and warm oh, oh, oh. If I was just in L.A. California dream Yeah, on a winter's day Stopped into a church I passed along the way I got all my dick I began to pray The preacher like the cold Yeah, he knows it makes me stay California take me On a winter's day If I gotta choose the coast, I gotta choose the east I live out there in South Beach with no cares But that don't mean a brother can't rest in the west you see some nice breasts in the west Smoke some nice sets in the west Y'all bitches is a mess, thinking I won't stop Giving L.A. props All I got is beef with those that violate me I shot a night late day, case closed, suitcase filled with clothes, linens and things, all the nice things. People start to flash 818s, 213s, 313s, VIGs, frequent niggas, plus holes and rock schools. If I wanna sweat, I take it a fat burger. Spend about a week on business, be smoking Crisco with some freaks from Crisco. I'm going, going back, back to Cali, 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 boy, you're dreaming. Oh, 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 o